So the Hawkeye show came out a year ago today. I just got done re-watching it and one thing stood out to me. A mysterious question I couldn't shake. What's, what's the deal with the Rogers musical? What's going on with it? Why is it here? What's the significance? This thing takes up a good few minutes of Hawkeye's first episode. It's the sole post credit scene, it's where we meet the show's titular character. That's a fairly prominent role for something considered by most to just be a bit of fun. So I did some thinking, and then a good deal more thinking, and then I came to a realization. The Rogers musical has a purpose here, arguably a very important one. It's the linchpin for one of Hawkeye's major themes, for the way this theme is explored and developed across these six episodes. And if you give me, what, like 11 minutes? I'll explain to you what I'm talking about here. I'll analyze Rogers the musical, the role it plays within the show, and you'll never look at it the same way again. In case you've not seen Hawkeye or you've forgotten, Rogers the Musical is a fictional stage show within the MCU, seemingly dramatizing the life of Steve Rogers, the first Captain America. The segment of it we see depicts the Battle of New York, the alien invasion from Avengers 1, as a song. It's disorienting for Clint Barton, aka Hawkeye, who was, you know, actually there, and it's disorienting for the viewer in a similar way. A gaudy, feverish, inaccurate reflection of something big he experienced, that we experienced too. And it is inaccurate. It has Ant-Man taking part in the battle, presumably due to Scott Lang's newfound fame. But that didn't happen. That isn't how it was. And for Clint, for us, it's a little uncomfortable that no one else seems to realize or care. We see the show advertised throughout the city in the background of subsequent scenes and episodes. It's popular. These people love it, while for us, for Clint, it's hard to watch. That's Rogers the Musical in a nutshell. That's the experience through which we're introduced to one of our protagonists. But hang on, the Hawkeye show's got two protagonists. There's also Kate Bishop, trust fund archer extraordinaire and wannabe sidekick. Maybe it's also worth thinking about the way she's introduced, because it kind of mirrors the way we meet Clint. Hawkeye opens in 2012, during the real Battle of New York. This time though, we're seeing it through Kate's eyes, and she's a kid at this point. No singing, no dancing, just lasers, explosions, and dead parents. Kate's terrified, she's in danger, but then she sees Clint, and seeing him inspires her, rallies her. I was alone, and I was terrified, but then I saw you, fighting aliens with a stick and a string. And I thought, if he could do that, then I didn't have to be scared. To Clint here, he's a spec ops agent caught in the middle of a battle against gods and aliens. He isn't super, physically or morally. And the viewer gets to see a lot of Clint's moral and physical fallibility throughout the MCU. Kate doesn't. The only version of Clint Kate got to see was her childhood self-saviour. This idealized image of Clint becomes central to Kate's own identity in the following years, and this idea of perspective, the differences between the image of Clint Kate's built up in her mind and the real Clint, these are essential to bear in mind. What am I selling, then? Huh? It's certainly not Halloween costumes and toys off the shelf. Inspiration, Clint. Thematically, there's a fair bit going on with this show. There's the ideas of legacy and family, which I think most viewers caught onto, but Hawkeye's also very interested in identity, and the differences between the public and private knowing of identity. The version of yourself the world gets, the version you see in the mirror, everything in between, everything else. We see this fixation in the show from the start, the way Kate's fiction of Clint propels her throughout life, and the difficulty it causes when this facade meets reality. Flipping back to the musical, we see the distress Clint faces upon seeing the facsimile of Natasha Romanoff, his partner in the Rogers musical. He's pained seeing a real person, a person he really, privately knew, become a distorted image for the world to know wrongly. This idea that there is right knowing and wrong knowing, that private knowing differs from public image, that's something the Rogers scene wants to set up. Take this moment. I know what happened, I was there. You knew who wasn't there. It's that guy. 
Or take the toilet scene. Selfie guy sees Clint simply as the guy on stage, as the public idea of Hawkeye, rather than seeing Clint, the kind of bummed out dad standing next to him, trying to take a leak. This wrong knowing is everywhere in Hawkeye, even away from the Avengers and the musicals. Look at the way Kate misunderstands utterly the roles, the characters of Jack and her mother. Look at the way Ellen has deluded herself into thinking she's the good guy here. Hiring an assassin to kill Clint, framing your own fiance. That's an unfortunate arrangement. Yes, sweetie. That's how the world works. This brings up an interesting problem, in fact, one I think it's worth dwelling on for a moment. Eleanor's perception of herself matches the one we had to begin with, the one Kate had right up until episode 5. The good guy, the good mum, trapped in a web of crime and mystery, manipulated by shady dudes. By the end of episode 6, we, along with Kate, realise how untrue all of this is, but Eleanor doesn't. She doesn't realise how misleading her own self-image is. She's still devoted to it. But is it misleading, or is it accurate? If these characters aren't in agreement, and they aren't, then who's to say? The viewer? Well, we were wrong before. All that's happened since then is that we've gained new information, and the only reason we stop acquiring new information after this point is that the show ends. Maybe if it hadn't, we'd have learned something exonerating Eleanor. All of this is to say, by ending the show with this disagreement still intact, with Eleanor still ardently convinced in this self-perception, Hawkeye acknowledges how slippery all of this is. How there's no objective, concrete answers on whose perceptions are correct, on whose knowing is right and whose is wrong. At the end of the day, we've got to trust that the show gave us all the relevant information. For all intents and purposes, Ellen is wrong and the heroes are right. But I think this beat finds the show acknowledging, ever so subtly, the unknowability of reality and the relativity of perception. The other thing Hawkeye seems to acknowledge is there's power here. Perception, even self-perception, can seem so flawed, so misguided, but that doesn't stop it from having an effect. In this case, blinding Eleanor to her role, her culpability in this messy mystery. The effects of image, of knowing, even wrong knowing, are everywhere here. Much of this show's plot is driven by Kate's misplaced suspicions around Jack, and there's even a sort of mirror to this in the Echo storyline, the way Maya's quest for revenge has utterly passed by the person perhaps most responsible for her father's death. But it isn't all negative. Kate's encounter with the real Clint, after living so long with her fiction of him, causes issues. But we also see the way Clint's encounter with this idealised image of himself drives him to become this larger-than-life hero by the show's finale. There's a real sense of reciprocity here. Fictions drive reality just as much as reality drives fiction, branding, role models, musicals. By the end of the show, then, Rogers the musical looks different. We even see Natasha's appearance in a whole new light after the Elena storylines played out. Back in episode 1, Clint's alone in a world which only seems to know Natasha wrongly through this glitzy Broadway distortion. Natasha's gone, and it feels like she's gone for good, because he's the only one that knew her, properly, privately, and the rest of the world celebrating this hollow, two-dimensional fiction. By the end, though, he knows he isn't. He's finally met Yelena, and they've shared this raw moment of remembrance together. If I was there, I could have stopped it. I could have, I could have changed it. Nothing was going to stop her, Elena. You know Natasha. He's reminded that there are others out there who really knew her, that her legacy lives on in others. It isn't just his life that Natasha saved, it's Yelena's, it's his family's, it's the rest of the world. And that even if everyone in that theatre, watching that musical, is knowing Natasha wrongly, they at least know she's a hero. We see that clearly. The knowing of Natasha is wider than just Clint, and the idea of Natasha, whether that's grounded on a personal level or in the public perception of her, can go further still, can still impact the real, even through stories, even through fiction, even through images. And after we've seen Clint and Kate skating around in costume for a big showstopper sequence, a guild of Vikings for their allies, after we've seen a shared, remembered Natasha save the day once more, the line between theatre and reality Hawkeye drew in its premiere blurs even more. After this point, 
Looking back to Rogers the musical and the function it plays in this show, it's not to be understood as some hollow, gaudy insult. No, it's to be understood as displaying the power of perception, of the facade. Seeing this, rejecting this, is the start of the journey Clint goes on throughout Hawkeye into an eventual acceptance. By the end of the show, Clint burns the Ronin suit, symbolically destroying his previous brand, his previous fiction. He sees the power of this gesture now in a way he probably wouldn't have done at the show's beginning. He's even helping Kate create her own super persona as the credits start to roll. Like hot shot, but, but, you know, hot. No. Lady Arrow? None of those. Okay, fine. You know what, actually, I have an idea. The dichotomies between public and private knowing, between real and false perceptions, they all come together by the end of Hawkeye. They're revealed to be different, but not separate. They touch, they interact, they bleed over into one another. Hawkeye ends embracing the power of the facade, embracing the power of these half-truths. There are lines here. Maybe some things, some perceptions are more real than others, but those lines aren't absolute. And by episode 6, the show's having as much fun playing around with masks, costumes, and the power they hold as we're having watching it. So when that post credit scene rolls around, and we get to see the full performance of that number, it isn't empty, insulting, or a bad joke. No, it's the perfect conclusion. It's the capstone of this journey Clint takes toward accepting his own legend, embracing his own symbolic power, and his position as a role model. And look, obviously I know that on a less abstract level, it's also a bit of musical, self-referential fun, but this bookends the show. It's how the show introduces us to one of its protagonists. Protagonists. That's an important plot of narrative real estate. Introductions matter, endings matter. And in this case, they used to set up and conclude a thematic subcurrent that runs throughout Hawkeye. I think that's neat. And hopefully by now, you do too. That's it for this video, but there is more to come. See, if you've been watching this channel a while, you'll probably know that I tend to do wider, less abstract retrospectives on these shows on their anniversaries. One of those is coming for Hawkeye, but it got too long, so I chopped a bit out and turned it into this, so I'd have something to release on the show's actual anniversary. Hopefully you enjoyed this little compromise, and I'll get right to work on part two, that more general retrospective, just as soon as I get done making this month's Patreon community video, which is let me check. Well, guess I'm off to watch Speed Racer then. Thanks for watching though, and shout out as always to all my Patreon supporters on screen now, especially strange folk. You've no idea how much it helps, and I appreciate every single one of you. See you later.